I'd like to start us off by acknowledging that this virtual presentation is taking place throughout the unceded territory of California, home to nearly 200 tribal nations. In particular, I'm speaking to you from Potwin land. We acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions. We encourage you to learn which tribal nations are indigenous to the area where you are now living. One excellent source of information is native land and Brooke, I think, is dropping the link to that website into the chat for you to explore later. At this point, we have a couple of poll questions uh, we'd like to make available to you now. If you can take just a minute to answer them while I go over a little bit about the background of our publication series, we will revisit the responses, which will give us a little bit of a foundation about uh, who's on the call, how familiar you are with the publication series and how you might use it. So go ahead and, and answer those questions now. And I'm gonna talk just briefly about this publication series. The call today, the Cone session today is really to celebrate this publication uh, in the series. Um, and the series is known as the California Naturalist Publication Series. This is a peer reviewed series within UCANR, the organization that houses our program. This particular publication, The Natural History of the California Current by Christopher Pinsetich and Sabrina Drill is the focus of today's session. The publications in the series itself includes overviews of specific bioregions in the state and special topics that will help sharpen the reader's understanding of California's ecosystems and environmental stewardship. So far, we have three publications uh, in the system, in the series. The first was The Natural History of the Sierra Nevada by Susie Coker and Kim Ingram. The second was The Natural History of the Central Coast by Bill Tiji and William Preston and Ann Polyakov. And now the new Natural History of the California Current. Brooke has dropped the landing page for all of these publications uh, into the chat. So if you wanna go, if you haven't seen the others, you can take a look and download a copy for free. We'll take a quick look to look at the uh, poll results. If we wanna close that poll and then take a look at the results, we'll walk through those very quickly before we start. All right, so it looks like question one, what best describes your connection to the program? We have a lot of uh, naturalists and climate stewards, certified naturalists and stewards with us. So that's great. Uh, uh, a few instructors, good also, and fans and friends of Chris Pinsetich, so another big group. All right. Have you ever read or used either of the California Naturalist publication, uh, publications in the series that are already out there? It looks like about 38% of you have. 38% um, have not. And uh, some of you have not even uh, been aware that that series is available. So we've just answered and addressed that concern. Uh, take a look and, and see what you think about those publications. How do you think you might use the new California Current publication? Um, most people are saying that uh, they're going to use it just to their, for their own professional development and, and knowledge. Uh, I'm sure many of our instructors have chosen uh, that uh, option to integrate it into their course. Um, and keeping in mind that if you are teaching a course on the coast, this automatically becomes a required reading of your course. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, we'll reiterate that later. Uh, some of you will share with friends and colleagues, uh, and we hope you do. And then um, others will use it in their own non-CalNet or non-climate stewards uh, educational program. How are you likely to share it with, uh, how likely are you to share this with others? Um, I guess it looks like 36% uh, said they are likely. Um, we've got about equal amounts, somewhat likely and very likely. And then a few um, are still trying to figure out uh, the publication itself. So that gives us a little bit of background about the uh, series and your familiarity with it and this publication and how you might use it. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing that poll and I want to introduce our speaker for today. Unfortunately, Sabrina Drill, the, the publication's co-author and our former uh, CalNAT program director, is unable to be with us today as the moderator due to a family emergency and she sends her regrets. 
Um, but today our speaker is Dr. Christopher Pinsetich. Uh, he is a long time and much loved uh, California naturalist course instructor. Uh, we don't exactly know how many courses uh, Chris has uh, taught. Um, we know it's in double digits and it's probably uh, one of the most of uh, any instructor in the program. Um, he's now leading the course uh, that's offered through the Point Reyes National Seashore Association. Uh, in his uh, daytime job, he's a senior environmental planner with Caltrans. He has a doctorate in environmental toxicology from the University of California, Davis, and a BS in marine biology from University of California, Santa Cruz. His passion for promoting ocean and sea turtle conservation has been shared through his speaking engagements, ranging from international scientific conferences to elementary school classrooms and everything in between. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pinsetich, and please go ahead and take it away. You're muted, Chris. Chris, and you want to unmute? Oh, thanks. <laughs> right, thanks. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, this is thanks for the great intro and really happy to be sharing all this. The, the journey to, to getting this publication done was kind of a long one, and I have a set of slides that I developed. Um, as I would teach this um, over the last couple of years, the slides are a little older. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll go through the slides. And, you know, the publication has some great photos and Sabrina was a huge help in getting the publication together. And I wish she could be here um, to, to share in this moment. Uh, but I really want to acknowledge her work and, and her dedication to getting this done. It was fantastic. Um, and so I have more photos in my slides than in the presentation. And People love looking at photos. So I'm gonna try this. We'll just go ahead and, and share my screen. Let's see, this should work. Do, do, do. There. Okay, so the slideshow should go bigger. Here we go. There we go. And how's that look? Pretty Great. Good, I hope. Yeah. Okay. Great. And so I developed this slideshow uh, when I was an employee at the Turtle Island Restoration Network, and that's a nonprofit in, um, in Marin County, just above the San Francisco Bay, that focused on locally on salmon, endangered salmon, and then globally on um, marine conservation issues, focused on sea turtles mostly, but also in focusing on sea turtles, helping uh, with a lot of different marine life. And so while I was at the Turtle Island Restoration Network, I started this journey as a California naturalist instructor, focusing on salmon and the ecosystems. And when we started this, we were told, try to run your class in 10 sessions. You have eight chapters of this new textbook and come up with one lecture of your own. And so I came up with this ocean lecture and it took me a while to develop the slides and then the opportunity arose to write a publication about it. So um, again, it was a long journey and I'm, I'm glad to have that uh, behind us and now just be able to focus on the product. Uh, so this slideshow is kind of old. Uh, I will go through it and we'll probably spend more time, um, you, you would spend more time on it if you were in a classroom setting than I'm gonna go through today. I'll just kind of go through a little quicker than normal. Let's see. That didn't work, that didn't work, and that didn't work. Okay, there we go, that worked, but it went too fast, let's see. So there's some pictures, pay, pay attention to, the, here we go. So here we are, we are all um, you know, on this massive floating rock covered by water, spinning through the universe. Um, and this is a famous photo taken by astronauts in orbit, and it's known as the blue marble photo. Um, the earth itself is primarily water. Statistics over here are for the, the math folks, but yeah, we're looking at 70% uh, of the surface of the earth is water. The sun, as we know, provides a lot of energy to our planet in driving various processes. And the temperature gradient experienced by the surface of the planet you know, 70% of that surface being water, um, the temperature gradient is mapped here. And so you can see along the equator, it's warm and at the poles, it's cold. And those temperature gradients drive movements. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about movement of the ocean 
because when you talk about the California current, you're talking about an ecosystem that's dynamic, that, that it's a moving ocean current. And while most of the critters in it can swim, some of them are just floating and, you know, they're subject to those movements and, and knowing why the California current exists where it does, um, it's, it's a result of these movements. So we're going to focus on these foundational movements, just like in our textbook, chapter two starts with the ground we stand on. You know, we need to look at some of these physical process that uh, created the California current. So the, the physical processes, the earth rotates, but the ocean and the atmosphere resist. You know, I often like to talk about that when we're outside and, and just ask the class, you know, is the wind blowing or are we standing still? And the earth is moving and the atmosphere is also standing still. So the atmosphere is, is appears to be rushing by us, but maybe we're the ones moving. So, you know, it's all about that perspective. And so having this global perspective and looking at some of the physical forces is what this slide is showing us. So the Coriolis effect is the first and the Coriolis effect is represented by these little curly arrows, okay? And it shows the strength of the arrows and how, you know, they are stronger at the equator and a little weaker at the poles. And it's caused by the rotation of the earth and the inertia of this mass um, and, and the mass experiencing this rotation when you're on a sphere, okay? So we are on a sphere and that sphere is rotating. And so that's why we have some of these effects that, that look a little wonky, but this is what happens. Um, the second diagram is over here on the right. And this is the Ekman spiral effect. So the Ekman spiral effect is critical to the generation of the California current and the processes that support the ecosystem. So the Ekman spiral diagram shows one, this vector is the wind. So the wind is this arrow, number one. Number two is, is this uh, same thing, the force from above being the wind. Number three arrow shows the effective direction of the current due to number four arrow, the Coriolis effect. So you have the wind blowing and then it actually, through the Coriolis effect, causes a translation of that vector force and the combined result is the ocean surface currents move between 45 and 90 degrees relative to the predominant wind direction. And so you can see this, this Ekman spiral effect, actually uh, the vectors change as the depth of the ocean increases. So it's a little complex, but it's worth mentioning because we're gonna get into you know, what the current is and, it's, and then understanding these forces helps us understand why it's there. Okay, what were the buttons that I used? There's the good button. Okay, so here's a big picture, kind of a two-dimensional look at the planet Earth and the main circular gyres in the ocean. We have blue area, blue arrows for cold currents, orange arrows for warm currents. You can see in the middle that blue arrow pointing down along California. That's our California current. It's the eastern arm of the North Pacific gyre. There are five main gyres in the ocean's currents. There's, there's a nonprofit focused on reducing ocean plastic called Five Gyres. And, and this is why it's representing these five main large ocean circulation gyres. So remember, the oceans and the atmosphere want to move around but it's the continents that get in their way and it creates these barriers. And then with the Coriolis effect, it creates these gyres. Okay, so I have little references at the bottom of each slide um, for the use of these images. So when we have West Coast upwelling, this is the process that we wanna focus on that is a physical process that results in a lot of biological activity. And so it's a schematic at the bottom here of the wind the X-Men transport pushing water away from the land. And then this um, variation in the temperature and the nutrients and the light. And this graphic here, if you can see my cursor, it, just, it brings in the biology to it. So we have this blue arrow of cold water coming up. And to read the diagram here, a schematic of the California current ecosystem displaying the dynamic forces at play offshore including the wind at the sea surface, these black arrows, the upwelling at the coast, the large blue arrow, the upwelling due to wind stress curl, which is the smaller blue arrows here, and the food web dynamics, these gray area arrows. 
Upwelling along continental coasts occurs around the globe. Um, just like there's five major ocean gyres, there's also five major areas of upwelling along the coast, but this diagram shows there's many more. Um, and they account for 50% of the global fisheries catch. So right there is a statistic that gives you a clue as to their importance in biology. Uh, these upwelling areas are the most productive areas in the world's oceans. Here's another diagram showing these processes. I, I just love these diagrams. Um, and this is kind of honing in on Point Arena. And apologies in advance for a lot of the focus of the, this presentation being this northern part of the coast where, where I am. But uh, that's, that's where I am and that's how I developed this. So the coastal upwelling brings nutrient rich water from the depths of the ocean up into the photic zone where light reaches, the, where the phytoplankton can harness sunlight to convert the nutrients into oxygen and biomass, which are gonna be our primary producers, which supports the large blooms of zooplankton, which are our primary consumers and an abundant uh, ecosystem of marine wildlife. So I really love this diagram. And so we're gonna look at a little bit more detail of, of the chemistry of the water um, the coastal upwelling mixes two very different water masses. Um, oxygen is at the surface. So this, this graph shows the percent maximum with this being 100% at the right end of our x-axis and at the top end of our y-axis, uh, we have depth, okay? So this top part of the graph, the upper left, is um, the surface of the ocean. And so at the surface, the nutrients are actually near 0% maximum, but at the surface, the oxygen is near 100% maximum. So we have a lot of oxygen at the surface, but not much nutrients. And that's because oxygen at the surface is created by phytoplankton, the microscopic plants of the sea. They use the nutrients to create oxygen. Phytoplankton produce more than half of the world's oxygen. When you take a breath, you are breathing the results of this phytoplankton in the ocean food web. The upwelling brings the nutrients towards the surface, mixing this really high oxygen content and nutrient content with the photic zone where they are limited in nutrients. So when we bring these two together, we have these magic reactions that, that result in high density of life. Here's another diagram showing a little bit closer the eastern half of the Pacific Ocean, which is, you know, we're on the west end of North America. We're on the east side of the Pacific Ocean. So the California current is influenced by the eastern edge of the North Pacific gyre here. And you can see it, it kind of bumps into the North America continent. It splits, some of it goes up and creates the Alaska current, and then the rest goes down and forms the California current. This diagram also shows where coastal well upwelling is the strongest in white, all through here. Um, there's a transition zone here, and then coastal downwelling actually occurs um, in this part of near Alaska. Uh, you're going to see a couple diagrams from this publication in teeny tiny letters at the bottom, uh, climate forcing in the California current ecosystem. And so here's one of them, and it's a schematic diagram illustrating the seasonal circulation of the large scale currents um, off the west coast, the California current, and the surface currents are here in white, and the subsurface is in black. And so what we see is in the spring and summer at the top, we have a really strong north to south California current. As, as summer blends into autumn, we see summer forms a little bit of a countercurrent along the coast, but that's a subsurface countercurrent. As we get into autumn, uh, that countercurrent actually comes up to the surface. And in winter, there's a very strong countercurrent along the coast, and that's known as the Davidson current in a lot of publications. And so the, um, the Davidson current forms uh, inshore of the main uh, southward flowing California current uh, in the winter. And, you know, I like to talk a lot about ocean pollution. And here we have San Francisco Bay. If you have all this pollution coming out of San Francisco Bay in the winter from rainstorms and whatnot, it's actually gonna flow north right into Point Reyes. 
where I teach a lot of the classes. So that's a connection I, I like to make with this whole California current scheme. And so another publication maps the California current large marine ecosystem, you know, as best as you can map a dynamic moving uh, fluid environment. And so it reaches along the entire West Coast beyond the tip of Baja, California. So we're looking at this area produced by physical forces that has resulted in some really cool biology. This is a diagram from the Climate Forcing in the California Current Ecosystem publication. And it looks at the regional characteristics of Southern California and Baja, Mexico, Central California and Northern California, and then up in Oregon and Washington, and how those ecosystems differ a bit. There's a generalized regional variation in physical biological processes within the large California current ecosystem. And the boundaries between these regions are only approximate and vary over time. Um, but we do see that, you know, from Southern California to to Northern California in and around Point Conception, there is a bit of a species boundary. You know, we tend to have different species in the mix and down here versus up here and then versus up here. And you could spend some time looking at each of these uh, different variables. One of the big variables is freshwater input. You know, during um, a typical year, there's a lot more freshwater input in this part of the California current marine ecosystem than down in the South. There's just more rain to the North. And here's a look side by side at a typical terrestrial food web or chain and a typical marine food web or chain. So the marine food web rely on phytoplankton as the primary producers, these little algae, you know, often single cells sometimes join together. Um, even giant kelp is just a conglomeration of a bunch of single cell algae. Uh, the single cell the phytoplankton is typically eaten by zooplankton first, and then the zooplankton by some carnivores. Here we have fishes, bigger fishes, and then even bigger. Um, and this is a marine mammal at the top of the marine food web, which is often the case, but not always. And plankton is a term for very small life forms that float or pelagic. Okay, so they're in the open ocean. You're going to hear that. You have zooplankton, which are an small animals, and then phytoplankton, which are small. Uh, plants. And so this is a diagram showing a habitat suitability model for a small shrimp, the krill. It's the euphacid shrimp, um, commonly known as krill, are a very abundant um, consumer that is critical to the life history of a lot of different creatures that we know and love. The krill are food for salmon, seabirds, and the whales. And so um, if you know a bit about the um, bathymetry of the California coast, this dark area with low habitat suitability is the continental shelf. Okay, it's about 150, 200 feet deep, and it's a, basically a flat plain. Okay, and then this is where the shelf drops off. And over here, you're in two or 3000 feet of water. And so all this red is that continental shelf upslope where the most intense upwelling occurs. And that's what creates really amazing habitat for the krill. And this is a suitability model that was actually developed for blue whale management. Okay, so if you wanna know where the blue whales are, you ask where is their food? And so this was um, done to support a big effort to help blue whales. Here's another diagram showing the marine ecosystem. Here's another diagram showing the marine ecosystem. Pretty simple, huh? So this is a fun image I got from this publication. Top-down modeling and bottom-up dynamics, linking a fisheries-based ecosystem model with climate hypothesis in the Northern California current. So the size of the words um, are related to the density and occurrence, you know, more likely occurrence. So we have a lot of phytoplankton you know, and, and so on. And so hake, forage fish, copepods, you face it, these are the krill, okay? And so, yeah, this just is a fun diagram just to show how crazy complicated things are out there. Um, the publication, you know, it, it's 12 to 15 pages, depending on if you count the info boxes and such. 
um, it could easily be a huge book, right? I mean, when I was a student at UC Santa Cruz, we had huge books on, on marine biology and marine ecology. So uh, we did our best to summarize a really complex system. And here's a slide that shows that it's not all the same, okay? This slide shows two ecosystems um, next to each other that are only 250 kilometers apart. One is near Vancouver Island and the other is offshore of Vancouver Island at a depth of 2,250 meters. So, you know, about 7,000 feet maybe. And so one side is this common food chain we've been discussing. And the other side on the right is driven by chemosynthesis, not photosynthesis. And it occurs deep in the ocean at the very bottom where there's no sunlight at all driving all this. It's all driven by chemicals released from the Earth's crust, primarily sulfur. And so we have microbes at the primary producers that convert the sulfur into life. And then they, the tube worm eats the microbes, a spider crab eats the tube worm, and an octopus is the top of the food chain in this really unique ecosystem in the ocean. So to summarize, you know, seasonal upwelling drives a massive primary production in spring and summer. Secondary consumers exploit algal blooms to grow their populations in spring, summer, and fall. Summer and fall, prey abundance brings migrant whales, sea turtles, and seabirds from across the globe to the California current ecosystem. Satellite tracking of migratory animals reveals their seasonal foraging and breeding grounds offshore of California. And um, you know, I'm pretty lucky I get to do this California naturalist instructor job. Um, I've been doing my best to grow as a naturalist. I used to volunteer doing whale watching and now I get to be one of the main naturalists um, with the Oceanic Society. And people ask me, when's the best time to go out and see stuff? And I just say, well, what do you wanna see? Cause it's different every season. And you know, this really speaks, this slide really speaks to that variability. Um, and it's driven by this annual process. Here is a map of satellite tracked animals, all of them tagged in California by primarily by the folks at Stanford that have the Hopkins Marine Lab in Monterey and do a lot of great work all over the globe. They, act, they actually went down to South Central America and tagged a bunch of sea turtles, but most of the animals were tagged in California. And this massive map with all this confusion is summarized per species with their black silhouettes down at the bottom. So you can see tuna swim back and forth, not along the equator here, but you know, just uh, probably you know, around 35, 40 latitude back and forth to California. The little harbor seal um, here, out and back, out and back, back to California. Sharks up and down the coast and out to this mysterious region in the Pacific known as the Shark Cafe where it's probably um, their main breeding grounds. Here we have a seabird. I'm not sure which one, um, I forget. Here we have the leatherback sea turtle. They, we're gonna look at this a little bit more focused because that was the focus of our nonprofit work. And then here we have whales up and down the coast, down off of Costa Rica is where California's whales typically migrate for breeding. Really cool publication, lots to dig into. We do our best to just take a good look and, and share, you know, some of these amazing patterns. And so here's one of them, the leatherback sea turtle migrations into the California current ecosystem. And so this is from a publication that, you know, uh, really used satellite data to show where their main zones of their life history were. And the California current ecosystem is one of them. And so these are leatherback sea turtles, the, the largest living sea turtle. It's a living dinosaur that have been unchanged on the planet for over 65 million years. Um, and, and they originate at nesting sites over here in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, and they swim all the way across the Pacific, sometimes up north, sometimes straight across, back and forth to California about every two years. It takes them about uh, a half a year to two thirds of a year to get over here, and then they feed on jellyfish in the California current for about six or eight months in the summer and fall, and then they swim back. Pretty amazing migration. And to protect them, we have the Endangered Species Act. And so one of the statements in the Endangered Species Act is that if you designate a species, you should 
protect its habitat. So when I was working at the Sea Turtle Restoration Project under the Turtle Island Restoration Network, we were part of an effort to create that critical habitat. And this map shows the original areas proposed in blue as critical habitat. Um, and the satellite tracks of the sea turtles in black and green and red. And oh, the red is actually um, when they were killed in a fishery and the green is a dot where they were seen by a boat, okay? And so this is a little timeline, you know, it shows how old the slides were. Um, you know, in 2007, there was a petition and they responded in 2009 proposing 76,000 square miles. They received thousands of comments. Um, they missed their legal deadlines twice. So this process took much longer than it should have. And in the end, they designated these areas in, in gray, gray with the lines here. This represents our uh, political boundary where the United States has jurisdiction out to about 200 miles of the open ocean. And this represents the leatherback sea turtle final critical habitat. So um, over 41,000 square miles. At the time, it was the largest critical habitat for any endangered species ever. And since then, another sea turtle has a bigger critical habitat that includes a lot of the East Coast. So 16,910 square miles off of California of critical habitat for the leatherback. So the leatherback sea turtles, it, this area is protected for use as foraging habitat. It protects their prey species. It does not protect the actual sea turtle. The fisheries can continue to fish and accidentally kill these leatherback sea turtles. The critical habitat is habitat that's required to support the life history. And the lethal actions of fisheries are managed under another component of the Endangered Species Act. So we were all a little disappointed that we didn't get more protections for the actual sea turtle, but it is a really great thing. During my time there, we did a citizen science program and we got some amazing photos. We would just call out to all the different whale watching groups and individuals that had boats at, at harbors. We'd post flyers and, and we just wanted to increase the amount of science and understanding around this one species. And it really helped us gain a lot of uh, amazing photos to use for outreach and fundraising too. So it wouldn't be um, the California naturalist class if we didn't really talk about people and how we fit in, right? And so, you know, there's a lot of issues. This could be a whole 40 hour class on, on that, but um, we have developed a national marine sanctuary system. Um, it's a federal system. And we also now have a state system of marine protected areas. And so here's a quick map of what used to be the national marine sanctuaries off of central and Northern California there was a process proposed to expand them. And we had a lot of activists chiming in and we actually had a big victory to expand and change what was the Gulf of the Farallons Marine Sanctuary here. They adopted all this area past Point Arena into now what's called the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. And so that is basically the end of my slides, but I wanted to just briefly in the next three minutes um, share, let's see, I can't see my thing because the controls, let's see, there. Um, so now here's a map of the current sanctuaries, okay? I need to update those slides. So the current sanctuaries, whoops, the current sanctuaries, the greater Farallons is here where it originally was, and then it expanded and way up to here to Point Arena. And then we also have the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary here. That's a nice look. So up to Point Arita. And these are federal marine sanctuaries. They prohibit dumping and oil and, and, and fuel exploration, okay? They don't interfere with the fisheries. So that was a, a founding principle of their formation that the, um, the sanctuary system did not interfere with fisheries. This is a, a hole in the sanctuary. There's no marine sanctuary along the coast off of San Francisco and Pacifica because when these were formed, there was too much pollution. Too much pollution was coming off of San Francisco and Pacifica through a series of discharges that they were excluded from the sanctuary. But there's actually now an effort to include them because over the last couple of decades, they've improved the stormwater management and the municipal waste discharge off of San Francisco and Pacifica so that now they're no longer considered harmful dumpers into the, into the ocean. 
Um, so that's a really quick look. And, and really now we have this huge area of California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, marine protected area. So we have a huge network of state marine protected area. And so this is a complicated system. You know, with the federal system, I can say, here's what they all are. They're really there to support science and education. They don't limit fishing, but they do limit offshore oil and they do limit dumping. So they're not, you know, super restrictive. Some of these are the state areas. We have a state marine reserve, a marine conservation area, a state marine recreational management area, and then, then a special closure, right? So we have these main zones and they're everywhere up and down the coast in the, all these little pockets of, of different colors. Here's a more comprehensive, here's a zoom in on that map. And so, you know, it's really a complicated system and anywhere along the California coast, if you're teaching this class, I, you know, um, encourage you to figure this out. You know, where's your closest state marine area? And is it a fully protected area, a limited take area? a recreational area. There's those four different categories and, and it's really confusing sometimes. And, and this line here represents our state boundary, right? So we have state jurisdiction of the ocean waters out to, it's, oh shoot, is it three miles or seven miles? I think it's out to seven miles, um, but it might be less. I think it might be three. So um, the state jurisdiction is pretty small. So the state only has jurisdiction. If you're in San Francisco, you can see out to the Farallons and this is not state waters in between. This is federal waters. So the state has jurisdiction around the islands again, but, um, but that's a look at the state marine protected areas. So again, it would be great to, for me to update those slides. I think the old slides are on the, um, the resources for instructors. And then the final last thing I wanted to share is at the UC Press, you know, um, fantastic textbooks, fantastic field naturalist guides. This is one that I use a lot in the class. I show people and encourage them to buy a copy. And I actually have the author, Sarah Allen, is one of my guest instructors a lot. Um, she was a marine biologist at the Point Reyes National Seashore for many years and recently retired. And then the other book I like to point out as part of the UC guide is the uh, field guide to the birds of the Northern California coast. And this really focuses on these really challenging shorebirds, uh, gulls, offshore birds that you can see from the beach. And um, Jules Evans is the author of a book I use in my class on, on Point Reyes. And um, he was a, able to come for a while as a guest instructor, but no longer. And, and Rich Stalkup has passed and, and Keith Hansen still lives in the area. So all the avid birders, they, they know these names in the San Francisco Bay Area, hopefully. And this is a great resource. So that wraps up what I wanted to share. We really didn't look at the actual publication, um, but uh, the slides are great summary. And um, I hope that you guys all enjoyed that. And we might have time for some questions. I'm gonna try to figure out how to stop sharing here. Or if Greg, right. you wanna kick me off and-, and No, you're fine. Yeah, you can uh, choose stop share. And, yeah. um, and then while you're doing you that, no. I am going to request uh, our participants to put their questions for you into the chat. Uh, we've got a good amount of time for question and discussion. Uh, I see a couple people have already answered the question about state waters going out to three nautical miles. Yeah. Um, and you all should have the link to the publication itself, uh, the one that Chris is, is referring to. Uh, so you can open that up if you'd like from the website. But uh, let's take a minute to ask Chris some questions. Okay, I've hit one question in there. How will proposed wind farms such as in Humboldt Bay affect marine animals and birds? Yeah, that's a challenging one. I mean, I think, um, let's see. Yeah, you can still hear me. Um, I think one of the big issues is um, electromagnetic fields, EMF radiation. We really don't know, you know, there's a lot going on with that. Just, you know, what is that cell phone doing in my pocket kind of stuff. And that stuff is part of the picture. There's a lot of offshore um, energy already being produced in, in Europe. And in Europe, they have a much more conservative system for the environmental protections. They, they lean on what's known as the precautionary principle, where if they think that it's going to be a problem, they take precaution. You know, the United States, we have to have you know, a whole team of scientists and legal experts to say, yes, it's okay. And then we believe it's okay. 
um, or we just go for it because of the politics. But in the, I think with the, the stuff that's been done in other countries, we can learn a lot and we could take a closer look. So I don't have a, a full answer to that. Obviously, there's going to be noise effects. Noise is, is really interesting when you look at the, the physics of noise in the ocean. Um, you know, the only animals that can really tell a directional sense from noise in the ocean are ones that have an asymmetrical skull. Okay, that's because they've evolved that way um, because noise travels so fast in water compared to air. And so uh, the noise effects, the EMF effects, and then just the general increase in, in traffic that's likely to occur. You know, when we talk about whales, what's the big threat to whales? One of the big threats to whales now is, is collisions with shipping vessels. And uh, now that we're not hunting the whales, uh, they're not keeling over with pollution well the orcas are um, so it's different for every marine mammal they all have their own challenges but as we look at offshore energy you know i think we also need to be cognizant of, of the coastal impacts you know there's usually a landing zone in a sensitive area right on the coast um, is there a wetland there you know is that an important haul out for marine mammals you know there's a lot to consider other than just offshore and, you know, it's something that that a lot of the renewable energy projects do have their environmental impacts, you know, and so uh, it, it's a real reckoning that we're dealing with in this current situation. Chris, uh, another question, and, and Isabel, you may want to unmute just to clarify, but you, you mentioned that fishing is not limited in the in the protected areas. They're 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 protecting critical habitat. Um, they only limit offshore oil drilling or dumping. If limiting, what is the limiting and how is it enforced? I'm not entirely sure I'm getting your question, Isabel, um, but if you wanna come off mute, if you can. Oh yeah, I can see the question. Okay. So yeah, um, the fishing is limited by the standard you know, Pacific Fisheries Management Councils. There are fisheries managers, but the agreement with the sanctuaries is that there's no restrictions of fishing just because you're in a marine sanctuary. But when you are in a marine sanctuary, it's a hard no on any oil or exploration and then the dumping. I mean, even to the point where um, there were shark cage divers in the Farallons, you know, they get in a cage and look for sharks and they were using chickens for chumming and that was prohibited. They, that was a terrestrial based uh, product that was thrown into the ocean and, and that shut down their whole operation. They were illegally dumping. So um, one so, more time, um, one more time, Chris, what is the one, what is the restrictions on, on fishing then? What is that called again? Oh, the, the, they're not managed through the sanctuary system. Right. So there's the, a whole. But it's managed through. There's a ton of stuff. There's okay, the state so, management okay. and the federal management. So the federal okay. is the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. All right. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, how are the gray whale, California gray whales population doing or how is that uh, population? Yeah, doing? that's an interesting one. So the gray whales, there's a lot of people that believe that we are near their carrying capacity. You know, uh, there's many thousands now, they're not being hunted, they are dying and we're seeing a lot of them and we're wondering, you know, are, do they have enough food? Um, are we seeing old age now that we're just seeing the, the, you know, the population's big and the old ones are just dying. Um, obviously there's, there's vessel strike issues, but um, the gray whale population off the coast is the healthiest on the planet, okay? Uh, the gray whales are basically extirpated from the entire Atlantic Ocean, but in the Pacific Ocean, we do have them. And the ones that migrate from Alaska to um, Baja, Mexico um, have been protected. In fact, their breeding ground and, and calving ground uh, it, it's named after a whaler who switched over to a conservationist, Hammond's Lagoon. And so uh, we've had a protected population off the West Coast here in the California Current for many decades. And uh, well, maybe not fully protected for many decades, they are now and they're doing well. Yeah. All the whale populations on the West Coast are growing or uh, we're wondering if, you know, how much they can grow. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Another question is, do you see climate change effects on migration patterns? You showed some fantastic maps of migration of, of various species. Um, are there any, is there any data at this point on how those uh, migration patterns are, are being affected by climate change? You know, there's some scary modeling that climate change could shift entire ocean currents. Um, but right now we haven't seen that. 
What we have seen is documented shifts in intertidal species, okay? They, they're, we've, we've seen publications that, that, that species are moving north. Um, but with the big picture of migrations, um, we're still seeing that, you know, cold water holds more oxygen. That's just physics. And if you have more oxygen, you can support more life. So up in Alaska, there's still really high productivity. And we see a lot of critters, they're still going up there, right? So uh, th that basic, you know, physical process is going to remain. And, you know, it's going to be an interesting, um, you know, couple decades, you know, when we see a super rare seabird, uh, we have the, the northern gannet was is common on the East Coast, and it landed on the Farallon Islands about five years ago. You know, how did it get here? You know, the melting of the polar ice caps perhaps let it fly, you know, over the, the North Pole zone um, along Canada. So we're seeing species where they shouldn't be and documenting that, you know, one at a time is really um, sharing some more about these patterns. So, you know, who knows who's going to be the first person to see, you know, a, a stray migration that turns into a regular migration. Um, but right now, uh, there hasn't been much of a fundamental shift that we're aware of. I mean, the problem with marine biology is that there's so much to know that we don't know. Um, you know, it's really tough to make um, statements about the current status. You know, the most of the best statements are made about what happened six months ago or eight months ago um, in the ocean. Okay, um, a similar, along similar lines, has the quantity of phytoplankton in the California current been impacted by warming of the oceans? Yeah, it, it was very, very severely impacted um, when a big um, ocean blob of warm water came through. But, you know, there is a normal seven to eight year cycle called the North Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which you'd love to say is right at 10 years. But, you know, um, that we do see warming and cooling and of, of a pretty high variability and high degree that is more pronounced than the slow uptick of, of one degree Celsius, you know, of global warming. So um, to answer the question, yes, there are very obvious measured differences in, in the ecosystems due to these warm and cold trends. And the current just North Pacific decadal oscillation um, is a stronger trend right now than the slow warming of, of the, so you hear La Nina and El Nino, those are other seasonal trends uh, on big cycles, global ocean cycles that affect the temperature of the California current. And, and I'll just mention that there is a section in the publication about climate and the California current that goes into a little bit more information on that if you wanna look at that. Um, another question, uh, do sea turtles only eat moon jellies or are there other species that they choose to dine on? Was the critical was the critical field habitat for a specific species of jellyfish? Or you know, I don't think it was for a specific species of jellyfish, and I do know that if it was, it would be for Chrysora. And then, sorry, I don't have the species, but the Chrysora is the big golden jellyfish um, that has a really nice, like a light brown, golden, translucent color. Uh, it's a lot bigger. Um, and more nutritionally valuable than the moon jellies, which are typically, I don't know, like eight or 10 inches across. The, the Chrysora can be like one to two feet across typically. And um, so the moon jelly, they, they don't have a lot of the tentacles coming down either. Uh, the Chrysora is the main um, diet of the leatherback sea turtle. Okay. Another question, uh, do you know how close the current comes to the land off Morro Bay and the Cayucos? Um, the whales there come very close to the land. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about the ocean. So, you know, the ocean touches the land and the current is all part of it. So, um, you know, it, the uh, California current is what I chose because at the time there was a discussion of another publication that might be the kind of kelp forest and the near shore and the intertidal. And so that publication and I, you know, I don't think they advanced, but we agreed, you know, we would separate and I would stay offshore and they could stay near shore. Um, so, um, you know, the quick answer to that question is it's all kind of the ocean and this is like an ecosystem area um, with a, a lot of migration in and out. And so the California current, yeah, you, you know, it's all right there. You stand at the beach and look out and you're seeing the California current. All right. Um, 
I'm not seeing any additional questions. Are there any other questions uh, from the team that I've missed? And there's a comment, the gannet landed in Anya Nuevo. Guys, <laughs> this is one bird. If you see this bird, it is a life bird for anyone on the West Coast. And it's from the East Coast. And, and it's like the same bird. I love these stories where, you know, you make the connection to people like, you know, you go scuba diving and you see a rockfish. That is the same rockfish on that rock you saw three years ago. It is their home and this is where they live. You're not looking at some random animal. You're looking at the same thing, you know? So yeah, it's kudos for, for keeping an eye out for the gannet. All right. Well, I think we're going to start to wrap up here. I'll, I'll throw out one additional question. Uh, there were several uh, instructors on the call and I know you've addressed the instructors uh, previously, but uh, any, any suggestions on ways in which our CalNet instructors or even our climate stewards course instructors might um, integrate uh, this publication into their course? And certainly if they're on the coast somewhere, that's, that's gonna be something they're gonna need to do. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Chris? Oh gosh, it's so hard to say how to best teach course right now. Uh, we haven't even done slideshows for two years. I used to spend hours indoors, like clicking my slides and talking stories. And, and they'd be like, when do we get to go outside? And now we're just always outside and I email them the slides, you know? So in this case, that's a tough question to answer. You know, how does it make sense to integrate? You know, I love the, you know, drowning the students in information and then seeing them on the weekend for a hike, right? And you know, some of them take it all in, they're retired, they can read it all. And some of them are like, I just got off work and I just can't wait to go outside. Sorry, I didn't read anything, you know. Um, so it, it really varies. And, and I'll just say that uh, you, you just cast a wide net and sometimes you grab those people. And so just share it and see what happens. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. And, and thank you all for participating today.